Et, et que moi, vous... je vais peut-être me mettre là, comme ça, vous, vous pouvez oui. okay. vous voir, si ça va pour vous. Voilà, je crois qu'on est au complet ou presque. Donc, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à toutes et tous à cette rencontre sur, on va dire, les secrets de famille, mais plus largement le flou et l'incertitude autour des familles, des destins individuels et de l'histoire avec un grand H. C'est ce qu'on va trouver au cœur des livres d'Oriane Jancourt Gamignani et d'Eduardo Berti, livres pourtant très différents, mais on verra que les fils rouges et les passerelles sont nombreuses entre deux mots sur vous, Oriane, si vous permettez. Vous avez publié quatre romans avant celui-ci, dont « Tu n'as rien vu » à Adama sur l'extermination des handicapés sous le nazisme, livre qui vous a valu, entre autres, le prix de la Closerie des Lilas. Plus récemment, en 2020, il y a eu La femme et crevis, qui, pour résumer vraiment très schématiquement, parle de la folie chez les artistes, on pourrait dire. Et j'ajoute que vous dirigez la rédaction du magazine culturel Transfuge, que vous êtes franco-allemande et que vous êtes tombée toute petite dans la librairie, on peut le dire. Venons-en à ce livre-ci, Quand l'arbre tombe, publié en août dernier chez Grasset, c'est un livre qui décrit sept jours dans la vie d'une femme, Zélie, une femme que son vieux papa appelle au secours, au secours dans la propriété familiale en lui disant qu'il y a un problème avec les arbres qui tombent les uns après les autres. Entre eux, depuis des années, un lourd silence entoure la mort de leurs frères et fils respectifs. Cet arbre malade, ces arbres malades, c'est une manière de dire la douleur qui ronge le père, c'est un choix romanesque, une véritable préoccupation de ce héros ou de votre père. Ah, je pense que c'est le choix à la fois. Euh, le fait est que mon père a fini sa vie parmi les arbres et avec euh, ce sentiment que les arbres tombaient autour de lui. Peut-être que c'était aussi parce qu'il ne voulait pas voir sa propre chute. Et euh, évidemment, l'arbre, c'est toujours l'image de notre puissance et de notre vulnérabilité. À vous maintenant, Eduardo Berti. Vous êtes argentin, français et roumain, toujours roumain ou plus tout à fait Je ne suis pas français, je m'aimerais bien l'être. J'attends la réponse. Je suis de, de la France. <rire> Alors, Argentin et Roumain, traducteur, journaliste, éditeur, vous avez vécu plus de 10 ans à Paris après avoir quitté votre pays, l'Argentine, puis à Madrid et maintenant à Bordeaux. Vous avez publié 14 livres, dont le premier s'intitulait Le désordre électrique. Et puis en 2003, alors pour La vie impossible, vous recevez le prix Libre à lire et le prix Las Américas. Celui-là, c'était pour le prix imaginé en 2012, vous êtes membre de l'Oulipo. Gros plan maintenant sur deux livres complémentaires, parallèles à vous de, de nous dire, à savoir Un père étranger et Un fils étranger, tous deux publiés aux éditions de la Contralée. Il y est question d'exil, de voyage, tant d'exil et de voyage du narrateur que de son père, mort dix ans plus tôt, dont on sait juste qu'il a quitté la Roumanie et s'est réfugié en Argentine au début de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Le voyage se fait en Roumanie dans euh, un fils étranger. Par contre, dans un père étranger, 
fait. Vous nous emmenez dans différents endroits, mais notamment dans le Kent, où le narrateur veut vérifier un détail de la biographie de Joseph Conrad, enfin d'un certain Joseph qui ressemble furieusement à Joseph Conrad. Alors, dans les deux livres, il y a un déclencheur Le roman que votre père se déclencheur, c'est le roman que le père du narrateur votre père a écrit et que vous passez du temps avant de vous mettre à le lire. And you spent a certain time without reading this novel. And then there's another book that triggers the writing of un père étranger, and that's the book written by Jessie Conrad about her husband. Was this a, a nod of someone who likes literature, or is this some kind of a sign of faithfulness? Well, first of all, uh, good morning to everybody. Thanks for the invitation. It's not a real choice. For years, I had wanted to write a book about uh, my father's life, uh, his secrets, and the way I related to all of this. Uh, and I didn't have the courage. I, I couldn't find uh, the words or the right formats to write this book. I wrote a series of books which were a way of not writing this book that I had in me. After reading the book written by Joseph Con Jesse Conrad about Joseph that she wrote after he passed away uh, during his life. Uh, Jesse Conrad had published a recipe book with uh, an introduction by her husband. But following his passing away, she wrote a beautiful book about Joseph. And in this book, I found two things. First of all, a crazy reader who's convinced that Joseph Conrad uh, is making fun of him uh, in a short story and decides that he wants to kill Joseph Conrad. And then there's a second thing. It's an episode during the honeymoon of Joseph and Jesse. They decide uh, to take a boat and spend their honeymoon uh, in France. Uh, and uh, Joseph uh, ends up being seasick. Uh, he ends up being sick in France. And all of a sudden, Jesse is a foreigner in a foreign country. She'd never left uh, the UK. She's in front of a husband who's feverish, who speaks a language, probably Polish, that she doesn't understand, in a country where she doesn't understand anything at all. So she was as foreign as possible in this experience. I was very moved by these two episodes. So I started writing without uh, knowing what I wanted to do. I didn't know whether it would be a short story, whether it would be a novel, why I was writing all of this. And then all of a sudden, I understood it was my father's story. Uh, it was a transposition of my father's story. The Jesse Joseph couple is the couple uh, formed by my father with a woman who was 10, 12 years younger than him and who was Argentine. All of a sudden, I realized that I was actually writing the story of my father. And then there's this other story, uh, a story that's like a scaffolding. But usually what happens with the scaffolding is that you remove it, whereas I kept it. Yes, because there's the story of Joseph Conrad and the story of your father. Now, let's come back to your narrator, Oriane Jean-Claude Galliani. Uh, she's called Zélie. After the phone call from her father, her aging father, uh, she's a musician. She decides uh, to set aside all the concerts that have been scheduled to spend almost an entire week with her father on her family's estate. She says to herself, well, her family can do without her and would find her later on. In these two books, we're talking about identity. There's a lot of talk about identity, and I'd like you to come back to this explanation, the permanence of what's uh, uh, very similar. Yes, that's something that she says about her family, her husband and her children. But obviously, it resonates uh, in the relationship she has with her father. What's actually interesting with Zélie as a character is that she follows her father's obsession. She decides to believe him. And that's what I find interesting in her. What I like with literature are stories 
uh, of obsessions of uh, obsessive people. She decides to believe him. She follows him in the forest. He's uh, he comes from the city. He's a city dweller. He doesn't have a great expertise with trees, even though he lives uh, on this estate. And she follows him in this obsession, in this craziness. And uh, between them, they decide to save all these trees. So I do think there's the permanence of what is similar because uh, she's uh, in her 30s and she uh, becomes uh, the daughter following her father again. She is not faced with an 80-year-old man who's uh, um, towards the end of his life. She's uh, the daughter in front of her father. And that's what's very moving in this situation, in this sentence. When you're faced uh, with your parents' vulnerability, you suddenly decide uh, not to see. You turn a blind eye. You decide to believe that uh, all of this is going is never going to end, that the forest will remain intact and the trees are not going to fall. I'd like to read uh, an excerpt from Quand l'arbre tombe, where we see that uh, things that are similar are not permanent. It's a description of the father through her daughter's gaze, and the interpreters will let you listen to the original. Des arbres sains, et qu'ainsi leur soit rendu lumière et espace. Il s'apprêtait à se lancer dans une mission qu'aucun bûcheron ne voulait accomplir. Le bois mort se vendait peu et mal. Le boulot est un arbre de lumière, expliqua son père, un des premiers à pousser en mercenaire. Il se place au rang extérieur d'une forêt pour en protéger la profondeur. Mais aussi l'un des plus exposés au vent, à l'humidité. Il commença à couper les branches avec un large sécateur. Les lames triangulaires peinaient à s'enfoncer jusqu'à la chair blanche. Zélie ignorait que son père était capable de différencier un arbre de lumière et un arbre d'ombre. Il avait consacré l'essentiel de son existence à rejoindre de vastes bureaux, des bennes et de cuir crème, pour prendre des décisions éclairs sur des flux de capitaux qui traversaient le monde en tous sens. Un jour à Bangkok, le lendemain à New York, un jour à Beyrouth, le lendemain à Bonn. Les capitaux se déplaçaient en torpille dans les fonds sous-jacents de la planète et Paul les suivait à la trace. Et lorsqu'il émergeait de cet océan pour venir ici, il s'enfermait le plus souvent dans sa bibliothèque pour écrire sur, je cite, « la nature vertueuse ou dangereuse du capitalisme », comme s'intitulait l'un de ses articles de revue paru en 90. À l'aube d'un monde où toutes les chances de prospérité et de paix collective nous sont enfin données, il n'y a pas de capitalisme vertueux ou diabolique, comme il n'y a pas de sainteté de la démocratie. Il n'y a que des systèmes efficaces entre les mains d'hommes libres. La fierté avec laquelle il évoquait cet article à la table familiale 30 ans plus tôt, il aurait pu aussi l'appeler, avait-il dit en rigolant, « nos belles espérances ». Le même homme se concentrait aujourd'hui pour distinguer la lumière et l'ombre. Le même homme se réfugiait dans les bois et ne parlait plus qu'aux arbres. Leur racontait-il ce projet de société qu'il avait porté toute son existence, cet avenir radieux qu'aucune révélation n'avait su abolir, ni crise financière, ni scandale de corruption, ni Madoff, ni Watergate, ni 11 septembre, ni Trump, l'histoire enfin close par le ravissement du capitalisme Merci beaucoup. On voit, et un, Thank you very much. There's something similar between uh, your two books. Uh, there is a mooring of uh, what's individual in the collective, uh, a man uh, towards the end of his life. Voilà, il représente it's his story, and you somehow hint at the fact that uh, he's a man of his time, uh, the booming 30s, but he's been contradicted by uh, history. It, rem it reminds me of uh, François Giraud, who uh, received the Goncourt Prize, who does something uh, similar. So there's this idea of a disavowal, of a mistake uh, that's been made. Is that it? Well, there's always this notion of uh, judgment. His father is uh, weakening, but the story of this narrator is that she does not want to judge him. But uh, 
uh, she sees that this father is uh, nearing the end of his life, um, that the world he's lived in is uh, uh, nearing the end of his life. Uh, he was born in 1937. He grew up after World War II, and uh, he read uh, Raymond Aron. There's this whole notion of reconstruction, rebuilding. He's got this uh, notion of the end of history. There's Fukuyama, all these ideas. Uh, he's uh, been at his best in uh, the 90s. Uh, we're in 2020. All of this is crumbling. The world is changing. And I think his isolation in the forest um, there are plenty of reasons for that, but it's also a way of escaping uh, his failure, the failure of what he embodied, these people who believed in uh, progressive notions. And Zélie refuses uh, to judge him for, for it. She says, uh, you believed in work, uh, money for all, uh, money trickling down to everybody, everybody uh, making money, everybody getting rich, that the society would be thriving after the war. She really refuses to judge him too harshly for this. But on the other hand, she sees that the world is uh, ending with him. As I said, it's uh, it's... There's also a disavowal that uh, I perceive in the amount of time it takes you to read the novel written by your father, Eduardo Berti. It seems as though uh, you're a bit afraid. Maybe you should explain how this revelation, once you become a writer, he starts writing too. Well, when I published my first novel, uh, novel in which, but, but I only understood that later, in which, unbeknownst to me, I say a couple of things that could belong to his own biography, as if I already knew things about my family's history, uh, things that I hadn't realized very consciously. It was somehow in my blood, but I didn't know it. In this book, I ha I, there's this character who does a couple of things that my father did uh, and that I didn't know about. My father read this novel. He never said anything to me about all of this. But obviously, this novel had an effect for, on him because he started writing. He started writing a book. I was sure that he'd abandoned this idea. And at this stage, I decided to move to France for a certain amount of time. Uh, I didn't know how long I would stay there. I decided to settle down in, Fran in France, in Paris. And it was a little strange. It was as if we'd changed roles. Uh, I was becoming a foreigner in a foreign country. I was on starting to understand what it was to be a foreigner. And I guess he was trying to understand what it was to be a writer. It's as if we had switched lives at least temporarily, except I stayed, and he finished. Well, he didn't finish, but once he died, I discovered six notebooks. Six notebooks, and I don't know whether it's a novel. It's a book that goes diagonally. Uh, there's a storyline that starts, then it digresses, and then it continues to evolve, and then it digresses, uh, so it's unfinished. In Un Père étranger, I used my father's book. Un Père étranger is a first-person narra narration. The, the narrator is obviously my alter ego. He goes uh, to Europe to live there for a while. He tries to write a book about Conrad, and as he writes a book about Conrad, he stumbles against his father's ghost. So there, that's sort of the book's storyline with these two stories that are intertwined. And in the middle of this all, I've 
use excerpts of uh, my father's book, especially a story, because it's the story that I thought worked the best uh, autonomously, and it's the only one that speaks about uh, uh, Romania. It's the uh, one that speaks about water, about a river. So I took the storyline, but I didn't keep it the way it was. I didn't want to correct my father. That wasn't my idea. I wanted to co-write with my father. So I interfered, I interfere, and I write together with my father. I write alongside my father. I kept uh, everything that was good in what he wrote, because he wrote very beautiful pages. Would you mind reading us an excerpt of this book? And the interpreters will let you hear the original, because the book has not been translated. So the narrator has just settled down in Paris. Uh, the father, my father, is still alive. Dans les lettres que j'envoyais à mon père, je lui décrivais surtout mes promenades à travers la ville. Ce n'étaient pas des promenades aléatoires. Souvent, il me demandait de me rendre à tel ou tel endroit et de le décrire ensuite. Manifestement, il comparait mes récits avec ses souvenirs lointains. Et ma description, j'en ai peur, semblait un peu étrange et assez décevante. Autres yeux, autre temps. D'une certaine manière, L'expérience de ma première année à Paris fut médiatisée par ces vers épais. Les comparaisons que j'établissais avec Buenos Aires, les comparaisons que mon père établissait entre le Paris de mes lettres et celui qu'il tesserissait dans sa mémoire. Il y a eu un moment, sans que je m'en rende compte, où ces deux vers finirent par se dissoudre. Cela coïncida avec un fait plus ou moins lié. Un jour, je m'aperçus que je n'avais plus besoin de me pencher en avant quand on me parlait en français ou quand je m'asseyais devant le téléviseur, non pour regarder de vieux chanteurs de tango, mais des programmes français récents. Assurément, ma posture corporelle avait dû se redresser de manière progressive, comme une sorte d'aiguille qui, peu à peu, se positionne perpendiculairement au sol mais je n'avais pas été conscient du processus, du moins pas avant d'avoir atteint un point très éloigné de ma posture initiale. Je, je parle du tango parce qu'au début... Je, I speak about uh, tango because uh, originally the way I earned my money in Paris was uh, by writing scenarios for documentary films about uh, tango. It's uh, typical for Argentina to write scenarios about tango from Paris. It was absolutely crazy because uh, the system we had, well, I would receive uh, videotapes. Uh, it was uh, in the 20th century. So uh, they would send me videotapes that I received in France. I had to look at them. And sometimes I spent uh, four to five hours listening to old tango singers. Uh, I had the feeling that they were talking to me. Uh, they were using their own slang called uh, un fardo. And then I'd go to the bakers to buy some bread. And I'd think, oh, yes, of course. I'm in Paris. I had totally forgotten for these four or five hours. That's why I speak about tango. Well, in your two books, uh, we sometimes uh, wonder uh, what's right, what's wrong, what's uh, who what about uh, the author's alter ego? What about the narrator? There's this notion of defeat. The father's novel is called La Déroute, but there's a, a spelling mistake in the title. And so we never know what's wrong and what's right. Well, I wrote the book, uh, I wrote this novel in Spanish, and it was translated by Jean-Marie Saint-Luc. Uh, my father's novel is called Derrumbe in Spanish, uh, with a double R. Derrumbe means the collapse. But uh, he made spelling mistakes, so he only wrote, he wrote it with a single R. Derumbe does not exist in Spanish. And so in the novel, I say that uh, my father came up with a neologism. Some, and derumbe might mean uh, um, um, a detour. Uh, his, the first detour in my father's life, well, my father was born in 1914, he went to Paris, then came Nazism, Fascism, World War II, 
And then the second detour is him taking a boat to settle down in Buenos Aires. A poor Jean-Marie Saint-Luc had to translate all of this. And he spent months and months saying, I don't know what I should do with this. And then all of a sudden, I received a phone call from him. I know what I'm going to do with derumbe. I'll say, I'll write derout in French. It's brilliant, but it was far from being obvious. But to answer your question, it's true. It's true. That's not being invented. Now, there is uh, uncertainty in both your novels, and it is uh, the subject uh, of Bibliotopia of this year. Uh, uncertainty is, called, is caused in your novels by silence, family secrets. I don't think uh, I'll be spoiling anything, but in Oriane's uh, novel, there's uh, the death of uh, Zélie's brother, uh, the father's son, a tragic death that's been shrouded in silence. Do you think it's the silence that made it possible for the, father, for the brother's uh, companion uh, to take up such an important role in the family? The silence is not a bourgeois deliberate silence. Paul committed suicide, and it's a, a murder without a culprit, as we say in the book. So there's nothing you can do about it, and that is a source of deep guilt for those who uh, didn't see it coming. I think that when you are um, dogged by guilt, it's difficult to talk about it. So in addition, the his suicide took place in the forest, which is the place par excellence of silence. So the silence uh, becomes permanent. And in fact, the father loses his uh, speech at some time. Uh, he bought into the mirages of the post-war period. Uh, he no longer has access to speech. This is the difference between our two fathers, the man I'm describing is not a victim of history. He was not affected by the war. He was in France. He was on the right side of the population of the war. And I talk about this. His family was guiltily indifferent. He doesn't feel guilty about it, but uh, totally indifferent to the fate of Europe. So. In the glorious 30s, he was the man. He was a man of progress, optimism. He wasn't in the post-catastrophe uh, mindset that I describe here. As you mentioned, I'm half German, and I have seen this in Germany. But in France, this sentiment didn't exist. So this man is going to face the worst thing that can happen to you: losing a child. Uh, and he's going to become mute, thus discovering what it really means to find it impossible to express himself. And so I think it's inevitable when a tragedy like this strikes a family. How can you go back to speaking as you used to immediately thereafter? Your father is silent in the hospital. Eduardo Berti, you had time before he died. In fact, it took several months, and you were able to stay in Buenos Aires and visit him frequently. This brings us to the question of language, which is very important in both your books. He no longer speaks, or he says very little, and one day he speaks a a form of Romanian that, Romanian that no one understands. Yes, in un père étranger, I say that except for six or seven isolated words, and I even have a short dictionary of the seven words that he used during a, a Romanian that I'd heard over the 20 or 25 years, last years. The first time I really heard my father speak Romanian, I was about 25. 
He went with me to the Romanian embassy in Buenos Aires to get a passport because I wanted a second passport because there had recently been a putsch or a failed coup attempt in Argentina, and I thought it would be good to have a second passport. So when Ceausescu fell, he said, now we can go to Romania. And that's when I understood how foreign my father was to me. When he spoke Romanian, I could see his mouth move in ways that I'd never seen before. When you speak a language that's not your usual language, you speak differently and you use different hand gestures and even your voice changes. My voice is not the same depending on whether I'm speaking French or Spanish. My father had hidden a lot of things from us. He didn't speak about Romania or perhaps I should say that he had three or four anecdotes about Romania that he would trot out and they were quite exaggerated. Uh, it was the country where Google Maps weren't available, wasn't available. It was a, an iron curtain country. And in Romania, there was an extra uh, secondary iron curtain. So there was no transmission of his Romanian heritage. You say, I don't know whether it's true or not, that regularly your father did tell you secrets when you were six, 15, 16, 18. Well, he would drop these bombshells. One day he called me and said, you know, in actual fact, when he was that he was five or six years older than he had always said, that he'd had to change his age to get out of Romania, to avoid the draft and get out of Romania. We never knew with my father. He'd say one thing, and three years later he'd give us another explanation. But all that being true, he had to change his birth date in order to flee Romania. That was the first bombshell he dropped on the family, and it was very unsettling because whether we like it or not, we calculate. My father is such and such an age. I still have so many years to spend with him. And all of a sudden, I felt like he'd stolen five or six years from me. And a few years later, he called me to tell me that in actual fact, so he'd always told me about the, that he'd taken a boat to go to Argentina. It was true, but he had traveled with a woman he was planning to marry. So he had a first wife. Okay, so I learned that. I said, okay. And every time he called me, one day he called me to tell me he was writing a novel. Every time the phone rang and I heard my father's voice, I'd start trembling. And when he said, I'm writing a novel, I, ah, oh, what a relief. Because every time he called, I thought, what kind of bombshell is he going to drop this time? And then the confessions stopped. And the rest of the story are, is made up of things I discovered after his death. Why did he stop dropping these bombshells? Well, because he was getting to the most important confessions, the two most important confessions that he was not able or he didn't want to or he wasn't, didn't manage to tell me. I have my own theories about it, but I don't really know. I think that he might have been trying to tell me that he was Jewish and that that was why he had changed his family name. And when he was about to do that, we had two attacks in Israel. The Israeli embassy was completely destroyed. And that was, it was right next to the Romanian embassy. What year was that? It was in 1991. And then one or two years later, we had the Israelite uh, Association, which was attacked. Two buildings destroyed in Buenos Aires, two Jewish buildings destroyed in Buenos Aires. And I think that might have played a role in his decision to not tell me, to maintain silence. Uh, maybe that was the last straw, and he decided not to tell me. I, I don't even know if my mother knew. I don't know. When my father died, there were no longer any eyewitnesses. My father was an only child. The only uh, person I could talk to was the his last wife, 
and she told me that my father had confessed that he was Jewish uh, in the last year of his life, and she was Jewish, so maybe that helped him to come out, as it were, because uh, they were having uh, marital problems, and he, he came out with this piece of news. But apart from her, I, have, I would have no evidence. Yes, there's a whole file that a friend gave you in conditions and for reasons that we're not going to reveal because it would be a spoiler, but it's what led to the second book. Yes, I wasn't planning when I published Un Père Étranger to uh, write another book. I was convinced that everything I could recount based on the few verifiable facts I had had been told. There was nothing. I had pulled the all the thread out, and there was nothing else I could write without inventing, and I had no plan to write a second book called uh, Un Fils Etranger, and a very good friend, a lawyer living in Argentina, sent me as a gift the file, my, my father's naturalization file from 1951, and he didn't lie in that, obviously, and it, it was all there. There was his birthplace, the name of the boat he took, the, his date of arrival in Argentina, the uh, address of the house he was born in, all of this information that I thought was lost forever. And that is what led me to travel to Romania and, and to a new investigation. Let me now, we've talked about fathers, let's talk about mothers. Your books are both about fathers, deceased fathers. Uh, and the death of fathers, but mothers are strangely absent from your books. Un Père Étranger opens with your mother's funeral. Your uh, father's wife your mother is not present in the family property. She's uh, separate from the story. And then there's Paul's mother, uh, who's uh, completely dysfunctional. Could you tell me about these two women? The first mother is absent for fictional reasons. We wanted the meeting, the encounter, to be exclusively between the daughter and the father. I thought a lot about King Lear and the scene where the father and the daughter come together and it's almost too late, but there's an ultimate moment of joy before they both die. And I wanted to explore this moment, the idea that sometimes in life there are moments of extreme joy just before a disaster strikes. So we had to have this uh, father-daughter couple. The mother of my father? My grandfather is a dysfunctional person. He always said she didn't like me, she never loved me. What we understand, however, is that perhaps she wasn't a very good mother, but she was a very interesting woman in, this, in the story. In the book, we discover that During the Second World War, we were living, they were living in a bourgeois neighborhood in Paris. Uh, she continued to play bridge and golf. The French defeat was a humiliation, but nothing serious. And then this woman joined the Red Cross. She was a nurse by training. And in 1944, 1945, she began to work with refugees uh, coming back from the war who were telling about the Holocaust, who knew about what was happening to prisoners of war. Uh, they walked through Paris. So she, she became a sort of Sister Emmanuel, absolutely. And this is, in fact, the real story of my father's mother. So every day she would, uh, she would spend her time in hospital taking care of these people. This, these are things that we can read in the newspapers, but at the time nobody wanted to think about it, especially somebody from her social class. 
you don't want to lose your bridge time because uh, the train is leaving l late or is arriving late because there are refugees on it. She told us, she told these stories, and she told them in a brutal way because that was what her temperament was like. She was very abrupt, gruff, and uh, uh, people did not always appreciate her telling these stories. He was her only child. He would have liked her to be more maternal and that she spend more time taking care of him because he, he was only five. He loved his mother. He would run after her. She never had time for him. She was um, completely concentrated on her mission. So when I tell, say in the, tell in the book uh, about the period where he was becoming another man, when he's reading La Fontaine, when he's acquiring a more tragic view of life, he begins to understand that his mother was perhaps the one who was right. Perhaps she was the only one who was right in the whole family. So her funeral opens the book. Edouard Doberti, there's a, re a recurring part of your novel, Cynthia Club. Uh, the, the cemetery club selling plots in a bourgeois cemetery. This is an episode that you mock, but she always protected your father as well. Perhaps she's the one who enabled him to remain silent about his history. So she's not a source of revelation like Ariane's grandmother, but uh, she's a source of uh, silence. You can say no if you like. No. I think the mother's absence has two consequences. One is related to the relationship between the father and the son, who are at loggerheads. After and finally come together after having lived all these uh, years with the mother who was an intermediary between them. She was the translator. And uh, the father became even stranger without her, even more foreign. My father didn't have much of a social life. He had contacts with one friend from Romania, a childhood friend. They'd lost sight of each other in Europe, and one day my father was walking through the center of Buenos Aires, and he saw his friend coming towards him. It was totally unlikely. It was a total uh, fluke. But when, but apart from this friend, my father was very solitary. I think he always thought that he, he'd always have a young wife. When she died, I think he felt more vulnerable than ever. And that's why I begin the chapter with her funeral, to emphasize her absence. And in a way, the fact that in the Conrad part of the story, uh, I give the central role to Jesse, who's talking about Joseph, is an indirect way of uh, paying tribute to my, mare, my mother. So these are two um, fragile, be, uh, leaguered men. And Conrad is the third male presence who's also uh, very vulnerable. Yes, he had cyclical depression. He, he went through a lot of peaks and troughs. Now, a word about language. Your father spoke uh, Romanian. Spanish was not his mother tongue. We know that Joseph Conrad was Polish but wrote in English and then in French. Uh, sorry, but he, he spoke French. Your father, Paul, speaks French, but one gets the impression that the language of the trees is yet another language. Perhaps uh, the foreign languages here are 
botany and music. What role do these two languages play in your book? Music, yes, because the main character is, mus is a musician and he's very interested in music. The daughter and father are able to reconnect thanks to music at the beginning of the book. And in fact, it's funny because she's the pianist, but he's give, he gives her advice. I'd play this piece a little bit more like this, so you have to remember this and that about. So he's giving her piano lessons. He, he wants to remain in his role as a father. But anyway, they managed to reconnect through music. The mother does intervene sometimes. She says to, to the daughter, you need to watch out for your father. He's starting to talk to trees, and it's true. She sees him talking to trees. Um, there's a lot we don't know about the father because we're looking at him through the daughter's gaze. We don't know if he's confessing, if he's rebelling, or perhaps something else entirely. Is it some form of reconciliation with himself or with life? I, we don't know what he's saying to the trees. We don't know what he's saying on the last day before the end. But he does have a bond with trees. Up to the time when his son commits suicide, he was a father who led the conversation at the dinner table. And the subjects were always literature, music, and botany, as if he had decided uh, not to talk about um, materialistic aspects of his life as a finance uh, in finance. Yes, well, that's that's uh, a very French uh, way of being. I don't know if that means anything today, but he had this idea of l'esprit français, seventeenth, eighteenth century, where conversation is an art form. And at dinner, it is very rude to speak about uh, money or industry. That has nothing to do with the art of conversation. So I think that was his upbringing. He also uh, belonged to a social class that uh, upheld and per uh, perpetuated this. This is why uh, we, he has this habit at the dinner table. And the dinner table was also a place of joy in a family, being able to talk about literature and art, uh, get outside the family circumstances, can give rise to moments of communion. Was the son a stranger in this family? Was he a foreigner? In as much as he also was a musician, but was not able to make a living at, with his music, Zeli wants to become a musician, and his, her father says, but that's not a job. It's not a real job. Yes, uh, her father has a certain idea of what co constitutes a proper job. Uh, when Zeli reads about the ants and the cicada, uh, her father says, uh, if you're not like the ant, you won't have enough to eat. Uh, She's only a child, but instinctively she understands how desperate La Fontaine was when he wrote his fable. And the idea of, uh, if you're not able to work, go ahead and sing, but you're going to die of hunger. He is blinded by his uh, quest for progress and his idealism, although it's very well-intentioned. And he therefore does not see that his son is also unable to uh, f find a job that uh, fulfills him and still be in his father's grace, good graces. I don't think that is why the son dies. But one thing is for sure, the father cannot see his son's uh, difficulty. He's forever uh, getting a new job being made redundant, and so on. Maybe we could read a passage from Quand la retombe, which illustrates the use of an image or a digression to explain a pain point. And this is what we find in Eduardo's books as well. When your father tries to tell his daughter that he doesn't want to cut down a yew tree because they're both 
Sorry, I'm, I'm waiting for you to find your page. They are uh, cutting down trees, cutting up trees that have fallen to the ground. And the yew tree, which is a uh, symbolically negative tree in the book, he doesn't want to fell it. But he uses an, in, an indirect way of saying so. Yes, it's, he's trying to talk about himself without saying so. Oui, peut-être, enfin, elle n'avait plus de souvenirs précis. Il empruntait chaque matin cette station. Très peu de gens y descendaient, très peu de gens y montaient. Et il l'aimait pour ça. Il se rapprochait d'un fauteuil, son débit ralentissait, il se calmait peu à peu. Je retrouvais, je retrouvais à chemin vert l'atmosphère du métro de mon enfance. Tous les matins, quand je descendais sur le quai à 9 h j'apercevais un vieil homme, assis sur un de ces atroces fauteuils de plastique orange, vissé au quai. Chaque jour, il était là. Il portait un imperméable long à ceinture d'un beige beurre qu'on ne trouvait autrefois que dans la boutique Burberry à Bloomsbury. Et il avait de beaux cheveux blancs qui ondulaient un peu à la cœur Douglas. Zélie hocha la tête. Il portait aussi au pied des baskets blanches, tu vois, le genre qu'on achète au supermarché. C'était plutôt incongru, ses chaussures avec cet impair. Enfin, chaque matin, à 9h, ce vieux monsieur, en imperméable et baskets blanches, qui se tenait assis sur son fauteuil de plastique, regardait les métros passer sans y monter. Paul se détendit, croisa les jambes, mais garda le dos droit. Il parlait de cet homme comme d'un vieil ami qu'il aurait à l'instant laissé sur le quai du métro. Je ne sais pas combien de temps il restait là, peut-être toute la matinée, ou peut-être ne descendait-il dans la station qu'à 9 heures, et puis remontait-il quelques minutes plus tard. Lorsque le train se faisait entendre dans le tunnel, il fermait les yeux. Quand le train s'arrêtait à quai, il scrutait un à un les gens qui descendaient. Je l'observais tous les jours, mais je n'ai jamais eu le temps ou le courage d'aller lui parler. Je me suis imaginé beaucoup de choses. J'ai pensé qu'il avait rendez-vous avec une femme sur ce quai, une vieille maîtresse, mais aucune femme ne s'est présentée. Alors je me suis dit qu'à une période antérieure, il avait rénové ou décoré cette station et qu'à la retraite, il venait observer son œuvre. Ou que c'était un ancien conducteur de train à qui le métier manquait. Zélie acquiesça. La sérénité retrouvée de son père adoucissait cette histoire qui agissait en comptine dans le salon sous le crépitement de la cheminée. Un jour, le type n'était plus là. Je regrettais de ne pas être allée lui dire un mot et puis j'oubliais. Aujourd'hui, je repense à lui. Je repense à ses baskets blanches qu'il devait mettre chaque matin pour traverser la ville jusqu'à la station de métro Chemin Vert. Je sais qu'il n'aurait pas voulu me parler. Il ne descendait pas dans cette station pour rencontrer quelqu'un. Et sa fille lui dit... Je... And his daughter says, I see what you mean. And it's a way of expressing f uh, fidelity to this tree. The old man that her father is, uh, doesn't, he, she doesn't understand why her father wants to see this man, but uh, and why this man is on the platform. But per, she says, perhaps in the end, it's a, the ghost of somebody who committed suicide by throwing himself in front of the train. And the same goes for the father going to see the tree where his son died. So the uncertainty about memory and forgetfulness. Eduardo, you have a passage where you say, I think it's on page 300, that all that will be left will be memory or forgetfulness. But you don't tell us which one is preferable. But novelists, aren't you writing to avoid forgetting? Yes, but in what my father handed down to me, it's a web of deliberate forgetfulness and selective memory. I think the two are always mixed, or they were in any case uh, for my father. When we talk about fiction, truth, the true and the false, uncertainty, perhaps I should say that neither of your books, Un fils étranger ou Un père étranger, are labeled as novels. Whereas your book, Oriane Jean Corgaliani, uh, states that it is a novel. How, uh, how do you. Ah, oh, you're right, it doesn't say novel. In Spanish, they did for Un père étranger. They did say it was a novel. But Oriane's book is published in a collection called Courage. What, what kind of courage? Well, I didn't choose the name of the collection. I don't know if the book is about courage. 
I like this collection. It's uh, Charles Danzig's uh, collection. I've pu published three books with them. I don't know if the book contains anything about courage. Why is it a novel? If I'd written it in the first person, it would have been centered around myself, the way I experienced uh, the events. That's the way it would have been read in any case. There are several per uh, characters in the novel, including my brother, including the tree. Will it fall? Will it not fall? I think in the first person, the forest would have only been part of the stage set, and I wanted it to be more of a proper character. In your book, I don't know which one of the two, I can't remember, Eduardo or Berti, there's a sentence, and this brings me back to the idea of courage. You say that Jesse Conrad, Joseph Conrad's wife, started by writing cookbooks. And did you say it here or in another book? Anyway, you said that Morally, they were above all suspicion. That's Conrad. When Jesse's cookbook is ready for publication, the publishers obviously want uh, Conrad to write the preface. And he's the one who coined this phrase that books, sorry, it's books that are the only beings that are above all suspicion. I don't know what it means. You'd have to ask Joseph Conrad, Conrad. but in your mind, because you're the one who noticed this sentence and included it in your book, well, for me, uh, maybe it's because my books are closer to sub suspicion, the suspicion of what I was going to write about my father after his death. To round off, could we ask you to read a passage from Le Fils Étranger, which explains why you wrote this book? It was a, I traveled to my father's birthplace called Galatz or Galati in Romania. It's quite close to the tri triple border with Moldova and the Ukraine. It's uh, one of the last um, towns uh, through which the Danube uh, flows before the border. And it was, I think, the second largest city after Bucharest at a time. At one time, it was a rich cosmopolitan city. Before the war, you mean? Yes, before the war. And it's next to uh, another town called Braila, where a lot of, a lot of uh, famous Romanian writers were born. So that's where I go. De très loin. C'est la première fois que je viens dans ce pays. Mon père est né ici, il y a 100 ans. Voilà plusieurs jours que je murmure ces mots comme une sorte de répétition ou d'incantation générale pour le moment où je devrais les prononcer. Je me le répète en anglais, ce qui peut être une erreur. Aurais-je dû les mémoriser en roumain Au contraire, c'est mieux ainsi. Pour éviter les déceptions, pour éviter que les autres ne me répondent en roumain et nous découvrent un peu frustrés qu'à part ces phrases diplomatiques, je ne comprends absolument rien. Je ne suis pas venu pour réconcilier mon père avec la judaïté, ni pour le réconcilier avec la Roumanie. Je n'imagine pas non plus être venu à Galatie en son nom, ni que d'une certaine façon j'y suis venu avec lui. Je soupçonne qu'il se serait moqué de ce voyage même, qu'il ne l'aurait pas encouragé. Cependant, je sais une chose, je ne me serais jamais pardonné de ne pas l'avoir fait. Voyage symbolique Peut-être. Quelqu'un, non sans arrogance, disait qu'un symbole est l'absence dans la présence et la présence dans l'absence. C'est une relation de ce genre qui existe entre mon père et cette ville. Voilà, on arrive à la conclusion. We're coming to the end of this uh, discussion. Maybe, Oriane, to start with, there's this idea of uh, reconciliation. These books, at, this, at these stages in both of your lives, are, there, they, are they there for reconciliation purposes? Or 
On the contrary, are they to say goodbye to the ones that we've lost on the way? I think there's this uh, issue of judgment. Very often, when a father dies, the children feel that they have to judge him. I think Zélie does not want to judge her father. She doesn't feel that she's in the right position to do so. She doesn't feel that she has the power to do so. Not because she's a daughter, because she loves him, but also because as an artist, she feels it's not her role to judge uh, anyone. Finally, because she believes that her father was uh, different, uh, embodied different people in his life, uh, she tells the story of uh, the uh, end of his life. So who is she going to judge? Is she going to judge the man that we, he was at the end of his life, the man that he was as a child, the man that he was as a young man? So uh, she decides uh, to leave her father with the trees. So it's not uh, sent. It's not. Uh, her father that she sentences. She says goodbye to him. It's, it's neither judgment nor reconciliation. It's a quest. It's uh, an investigation. It's there to understand what is mine and what is foreign to me. It's there to try and understand these memories uh, that had been hidden by my father that uh, were not passed on to me. I tried to rebuild it, to reconstruct it, to try and understand. And that's probably the role of writers. Thank you. Thank you very much. question. Turning towards the audience, uh, I'm sure that there will be questions before uh, you can go up to the, upper to the upper floor to have your book signs either by uh, Oriane or by Eduardo. With a microphone. Eduardo, at the beginning of the session, you said that Jesse waited for her husband to die to write his biography. Was it the same thing for you? Did you have to wait for your father to pass away? Uh, did it release you? Yes, probably. Not only my father, but also two or three other people who were close to me, including uh, this woman who uh, was his last partner. So yes, I had to wait for a certain amount of time to go by. Uh, just like the, these six notebooks uh, that I received from my father, I wasn't able to read them immediately. I was too vulnerable. It was uh, too close to my heart. I had to wait for a certain amount of time to go by. It may have been naive from me. I felt that it would make my father live slightly longer because he still had things to tell me. It was to ex extend his life uh, in a certain way. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. It's a very good question. Maybe another question from the audience? If there are none, then what I would suggest is that you go up to the upper floor for the signing.